those i tell you those new mac m1s are freaking amazing but don't buy one if you use universal audio interfaces because they're not compliant <laughs> giving you a hard time no i use focus right so i'm good but the the new m1s they destroy the 2018 mac minis when they're all maxed out the new M1 Mac minis only have 16 gigs of RAM and they destroy a 64 gig two-year-old machine. So a lot of, a lot of uh, technology moving forward really fast. 100 tracks, 10 plugins in every track. No problem. No sweat. Don't even hear the fan run. So what, what is uh, the rest of your rig? What, is, uh, what do you do to work your magic? Um, let's see. I have, um, started using 500 series stuff. I have an API, uh, 312C is my main, uh, mic pre. And, uh, I use that for vocals, acoustic guitar, anything where I have a single mic goes to the API, uh, for band stuff. Uh, we use the black lion Altair mic pre's. I have four channels of that. Um, the, I have a good old ART MPA gold that has uh, good tubes in it, replace the tubes in it. And, oh man, I just knew tubes made it sound better. Um, but they're not a bad, they're not a bad stock, uh, preamp out of the box. They actually have a nice, uh, nice sound to them and nice and warm. Uh, and then the rest of it is, uh, I have, um, 16 channels of, uh, focus, right. Claret. And for anything else, I mean, those Mike Priest and the Claret are great. They're great. And they also have a, a switch where you can go between the Claret Mike Pre and an ISA Focusrite type of Mike Pre. So you can get two different sounds from the same unit. It's pretty incredible what we can do with uh, little boxes <laughs> that don't occupy a whole lot of space. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, you used to have to get these big you know, you just have a reel to reel, then you had your, your console and it took up like the size of a dinner table. And, you know, it's just, you can really do stuff very compactly, you know? And, um, you know, for me, it's just, I need good speakers, uh, good mic pre, like a really good mic pre, and then good mid-level mic pre's. The black lions are great. Uh, the ART is probably like, B minus and uh, the Claret uh, mic pre's are, I'd give them a B plus, but the API is like A plus. That's an A plus, A plus mic pre. So you and I got into recording together because of a long sorted history. Uh, you are the guitar player for Crooked Crow and I with was. which you met Jamie and probably to a lesser extent at the time was introduced to, to me and yellow tie guy as a band. Uh, so it took us like 10, 10 years or something to get into your home studio. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I, uh, hooked up with, uh, with Bruce. I actually, um, bumped into Bruce Parker, our singer at a Butch Walker show at, um, on U street. And he told me that, uh, their lead guitar player was taking a break and my band um, was having some tension at the time. I was playing with um, stolen Camaros and um, turns out that two weeks into playing with crooked crow stolen Camaros broke up. I, I had no idea that our drummer and guitar player hated each other with passion, <laughs> but it came to a head after a fundraising gig we did. And um, so I went and played lead guitar for the final wave of Crooked Crows, like two years. And our last show was the uh, police and firemen games. So aside from all the live shows, you did some uh, guitar work in the studio there. Were you already like dabbling in home recording at that point? I, I have actually had a home studio for 14 years. 15 years now, 15 years now. And um, so we put an addition on the house and turned my old studio, which was very small, nine by 12, 
and turned that into our master bedroom. We went 16 feet off the back of the house. So this is the old master bedroom and we turned it into the studio. And uh, aside from Yellow Tie Guy, what, what kinds of projects do you work in or work on uh, from the home studio? Uh, right now, you know, we do a fair amount of mixing. We're doing a lot of demo tracks. Um, I've been focusing a lot more on co-writing. We're, uh, I'm, we're writing songs to pitch to modern country artists. And so I've been taking a lot of the better songs and we've been working them up as, as polished demos to go pitch to publishers, managers, um, and, you know, potentially artists. Uh, of course, we can't just go to Tim McGraw and say, hey, Tim, we have a song we'd like you to listen to. So you, you go through the publisher, go through the manager if you're targeting him. But local artists, you know, trying to do set up co-writes with local artists and you know, have them play, um, you know, play the songs and their shows. And, and hopefully, you know, as they ascend, you will ascend with them as, as a co-writer. Um, so I've done some, done a little bit of co-writing with uh, my current singer, Scott Kurt, who actually has the new song out today um, that I did not co-write with him. He co-write with some guys in, in Nashville. And um, so really just, focusing a lot on that we're doing some mixing uh uh every once in a while we do voiceover work for videos and uh occasionally we do background music for some of the video work as well and that's a a portion of the i guess like creative outlets that you have because you you come from a background in like cre just creative design in general right yeah actually um in college i was a painter and uh, got out and, you know, you realize when you're a painter in college, you can't make a living as a painter. That's why they call them starving artists. So <laughs> I uh, transitioned into graphic design and uh, did that because I could actually get a job and make a living. I thought you were going to say you transitioned into music to make a living. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. That's like I want to be a starving musician. So <laughs> maybe maybe so. that's the ticket is to it. To really do it, you've got to be a painter and a musician, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, you'd have half a salary that way. <laughs> so you wouldn't you wouldn't be terribly starving, but you'd be eating like cheese crackers and water. But it is kind of funny to see all of the the relationships come together, and and you probably see this a lot that the between album art and video recording, voiceover work. Uh, you know, like meetings and presentations, like all of the, or just promoting them with posters and flyers and, and things like that. Like there's just so much content. Oh, yeah. It's, that... it's, it's amazing. Uh, you know, I, I love doing any kind of design work that has to do with music. And uh, just cause I love music so much. I mean, it's been a big part of my life for such a long time. And uh you know, being able to do something that has to do with music that's not music is, is always fun. Very cool. Better than, better than doing it, you know, more fun than doing it for a corporate client or you're following guidelines and color schemes and logos and make the logo bigger and things like that, which pay the bills and pay them very well. Uh, but the musician, you know, doing stuff for musicians is more glory work. You have um, mentioned that you're a part of a course that you maintain to, to keep up the recording and mixing chops and stay current on gear. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, I'm a avid follower of a, a Los Angeles producer named Warren Hewitt. Um, it's not a cult. Uh, <laughs> it's called, it's called produce like a pro. And I um, joined them, I guess a little over two years ago. And it's basically mixing, producing cor production courses. And, uh, you know, I started watching Warren do a weekly live mix and he, you just watch him on YouTube and he would mix a song and you'd watch him. He'd ask some questions. Um, he'd tell you what he was doing. He's Warren is, he is, his gift is he is a great communicator. He can really synthesize down the simple aspects of what he's doing and explain it in a way you can understand. Like for years, I never really understood what a compressor did. 
until he explained it. And then I have not forgotten it since, you know, it's, it's, is great and why you want to use one why you don't use one what to listen for and his his big thing that that i really like is he's very practical he uses the same plugins anybody else can use you know he's a pro tools user but you can get any of these plugins for logic or reaper or studio one any other daw but he uses very common plugins that everybody uses and he gets incredible results and he uses those plugins to mix and record Aerosmith or Rick Springfield or any one of his other clients. It's pretty so encouraging it, when you see the, the professionals using the same resources as you. Oh yeah. Yeah. And he shows you what he's doing with them. So you can use the same approach, same settings on your own work. But the nice thing, is, the big thing I think about Warren is he tells you what to listen to and for and to keep mindful of certain things that you don't really you wouldn't really think about unless someone said hey you need to pay attention to this um because you know before that i used to watch a few videos and wing it and i was getting better gradually but since you know taking warren's courses and, and watching him every week and it's just the learning curve is you know, what I know, my knowledge is just skyrocketed. I, I just sent a, a mix to a guy today, a demo mix for a, a new song I just finished writing. And uh, he wanted to know why the demo mix I did for him last week didn't sound as good. And I told him, I didn't know what I knew. <laughs> I, didn't, I, I didn't know. I didn't know last week what I know this week. So there you go. <laughs> That's so great. Just, you know, the, the growth is you're constantly growing, constantly learning. And I don't mind, you know, even going back and reinforcing the basics because the deeper you get into it, you know, you really need to go back and take a refresher and go, okay, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? Am I really listening to it? Do I need to put this EQ on this track? Do I need to compress this track? No, I don't have to, but why am I doing it? I was doing things, you know, you find yourself doing things just to do them, but not because you actually think they need to be done. So it's still so much about like listening, listening with your ears first and not just from a, a technological standpoint. Yeah. I mean, your, your ears are, or everything, you know, it, you know, if you can't hear and listen, then you can't really make any decisions. And, you know, if you have bad ears or ringing ears, you know, that's never a good thing. But after years of playing live music, I, I do. <laughs> I, I'm sure I have hearing loss of some sort, but, um, but yeah, listening is, is really the most important aspect of it. For the uh, yellow tie guy track information. Um, part of it is to, that we wanted to try was to work with different studios and work with different producers. Um, and that's gotten a little, a little more difficult in some ways since uh, pandemic began, but we did get a chance to get in with you before things shut down. And yeah. Um, so I, what, what do you think that you brought that was unique from you that, especially with regards to information in all the ways that it could have turned out and all the things it could have become, you know, can well, you talk a little bit about your impression on, on information? Yeah. I, I think, we had the opportunity to do some pre-production on it beforehand. So every, we came, did some slight modifications to the arrangement, which I think helped streamline it and keep the, keep the interest in the song strong throughout the whole song. So we weren't doing too much repeating. We were just building, building, just building blocks, building blocks, building blocks all the way to the end of the song. So we were introducing new things. And then when we had you guys in here, um, unfortunately, with the size of the room, you know, we can't have everybody, all four guys. Well, I actually was five with Eric on percussion and your drummer at the time. So we brought people in for different instruments and and then um, kind of built from there. So it's kind of kind of the way I usually work when I'm doing a demo, one instrument at a time. So I but I think. You know, all in all, you know, it, it's not ideal. I would have loved to have had the drums and bass and guitar recorded 
same time. Just so you guys have that good tight live thing going. Um, but I think we were able to capture a really nice tight track. Just, you know, laying down scratch tracks and then having Cole come in and do drums. Jamie come in and do bass. You come in, could do your guitar and your vocals. And then Eric came in and put all the percussion to it. But ideally, I would have loved to have recorded you guys all at one time. Do you feel like you got the tracks that you you imagined in your head? Because you had heard a, an early version of it. And so mm -hmm. you kind of had some sense of what you were hoping to get tracked. You know, do you feel like you got those uh, in the sessions? I think we did. I really think we did. Um, I was really happy with how all the tracks came out and how they sounded together. Um, I love the mix that was done up at Harbor Red. You know, I thought he, he even took it to another level, which is great. But I think, you know, what we got done here, if it hadn't been done well, the Harbor Red mix wouldn't have sounded as good as it did. Do you ever feel uh, like a little concerned as a as an engineer and not necessarily having the control over the mix and not knowing how the other person's going to to treat your work? Uh, you know, ideally, I like to, you know, if I start the project, I want to be able to finish it, you know, and hear and and mix it to how I hear it in my head, which I probably would have mixed it a little differently than Harbor Red, but that's just because my musical styles, how I write, you know, the music I listen to are different than, you know, maybe how he writes and what he listens to and what he plays and things like that. So he brought himself to it. I would have brought myself to it. So it would have been different, but I still think, you know, each mix could have stood together side by side. Is it, uh, is it, uh, fun to think about the fact that there is uh, like all of these hands passing along the music and not just in this project, but I mean, it, it's very common to have a different engineer and a different mixer and a different mastering engineer and have these, these kind of uh, layers to the music. Is that a fun opportunity for collaboration? Are there other people in the area that you like to work with to try to be involved in different processes? Yeah. Uh yeah, that could be a that could be a lot of fun. Uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, I I have a, a client that I do design work for, and he puts out an album every couple of years, and he'll go and record most of the tracks from his home studio. Then he has tracks recorded, you know, the drums recorded in a studio, in a nice sounding room, and then he has people top line on it, and then he'll send that off to a completely different mixer and have them mix it. Um, uh, my singer, Scott Kurt does something similar. He'll go, he goes and co-writes songs down in Nashville. Then he will record remotely with a studio in Nashville. He'll put his vocals and his acoustic on it from his home studio. And then he'll send it to another guy to mix and then another guy to master. So this is whole process of a lot of people being uh, involved uh, in the final product. And it's, it's kind of nice. Keeps everybody working, keeps everyone paid. It's a, you know, a, but, you know, a little different than looking at uh, the records of old and seeing like that one person, you know, that produced it, you know, or did this. Yeah. Um, yep. Yep. I, I mean, there's I, some, there's some great mixers out there. If you want your song mixed by Chris Lord allergy, it's going to put you back about six grand. And so. and you'll you'll get a six thousand dollar mix. <laughs> oh yeah, it'll sound just like Nickelback. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, if that's the sound you're after, that's the right the right place to send it to. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I mean Chris Lloyd, he's he's a master uh, at mixing, and you will get something that sounds like it was mixed by him. Now, whether or not it sounds like Nickelback. If you don't give them something that comes in sounding like Nickelback, it probably won't come out sounding like right. Nickelback. But <laughs> he, he mixed a song for one of my design clients, The Villains, and they had an album version of the song, and then they had the CLA mix. And I liked the album version of the song a lot. And then I heard the CLA mix, I'm like, yeah, that was for this single. So that is a different mix. And it sounds, you know, the drums were bigger, you know, it kind of has 
all the characteristics of a CLA mix, you know, bigger drums, a little more compression, you know, everything is just really tight and glued together um, very tightly, but it sounded amazing. Well, it's definitely part of, uh, I guess, the the fun that we wanted to have in ourselves exploring, you know, the possible collaboration between different people, because there's not just great personalities in the area, but different experiences. And, and it's fun to hear those little qualities work their way into, you know, work their way into the individual tracks. Yeah. And, and every studio is going to sound different. If you recorded it, you know, with uh, inner ear, it would sound different than if you recorded it at innovation station, or if you went to like Ivacota and recorded there, you know, every studio, you know, 38 North, they'd all have their own sonic signature on it. Yeah, the building even has a personality. Same, even if you had the same mixer and engineer on it, it would all sound different. Yeah, the, the, the buildings themselves have their own personalities and then so do the engineers that are working on it. Yeah, yep. So yep. there's... It's a, a fun combination. It's a, a little like a, like a connect the dots game or something, a connect four or a, a, yeah. a memory game. You just keep flipping over the cards, you know, just to see who sounds like what. It might be fun to, to even in this project send out um, the original tracks to a lot of different mixing engineers and just, mm. you know, even just to, to show off the, the talent of the different mixing engineers in the area. Yeah, I mean, it's even if you have different drummers on the same drum kit, right? The kit's going to sound completely different. You know, I had Ben Tufts in here uh, two falls ago to record a drum track, and on the same kit that my other drummer buddy Dave Wine plays on, and it sounded different with Ben playing it than on Dave. You know, it track all the tracks were great, both guys played great, but it's just you know, it, it's amazing, like the little subtle changes, you know, just a different guy on the same instrument sounds completely different. And the subtle nuances make a make a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing this interview with us, Mark. How do we send people to learn more about you and your studio? OK, uh, studio website is Fred, the letter N and then the word Elvis. So Fred and Elvis dot com. So do you want to tell the story of Fred and Elvis Guitar Lounge? Okay. Um, a friend of my wife, Karen, uh, sent us a little plaque, one of those man cave plaques, and it just said, Fred and Elvis's Guitar Lounge, bring your own beer and amp. And uh, we got it. And we're like, where are we going to hang this? Well, we're going to hang it on the door of the studio. Okay, so we just started calling it Fred and Elvis's Guitar Lounge, and um, Fred and Elvis were our first two cats' names. So it is christened Fred and Elvis after our two wonderful cats, former cats. Named after musicians, I'm sure. Well, Fred was just a Fred. Elvis was named <laughs> after Elvis. He was it's, named after the king. That's cool to have, uh, you know, your... Uh your family immortalized and on a plaque and then have that become the studio. Like that's a really, that's a really fun story. You know, yeah, we couldn't think of anything to call it. So that's, you know, it's like, well, we let our friend who sent us this gift name our studio. They won, they won title rights, huh? <laughs> they did. Best, best idea wins. Very cool, Mark. Thanks for joining us on this interview. Sure, Daniel.